Okay, well, today on EV Brief, uh, we're joined by Dr. Alina Dini. Uh, Dr. Dini has a, an incredible breadth of experience in the clean energy and sustainability sectors, specifically based around electric vehicles. Um, and um, from, from working for perhaps the best known EV brand in the world, Tesla, to actually starting up her new uh, company, Whirl. Um, Alina, thank you so much for joining me on EV Brief today. Thanks so much for having me, Jonathan. Well, look, first off, what is it that draws you to electric vehicles and clean energy? Yeah, look, for me, electric vehicles are a conduit into a clean energy lifestyle. And what I mean by that is, um, so if you own your own home or even if you live in an apartment complex, you're going to refuel your car using electricity and you can choose renewable electricity. So that opens the doors to so many other features. Secondly, because of the onboard storage of electricity in a, in a battery in an electric vehicle, you can actually participate in the energy market in due course, not immediately, by feeding that energy in your car back to your home or back to the grid at times of need. So there's lots of aspects of driving, which is something we're all very familiar with, but electric motoring allows you to participate in a clean energy economy in ways that you never imagined possible before. And then in terms of why I really like an electric car is if you've never been in one or driven one, it's a completely different but positive driving experience. And what I mean by that is it's quiet, it's peaceful, it's very zippy and easy to drive. Um, and you, you don't have to feel guilty about your environmental impact because of that renewably generated electricity is powering your car. Uh, you can feel comfortable that your impact when you, when you travel is, is as low as possible in a passenger vehicle. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of countries now accelerating their, their fleets towards zero emissions vehicles. So we've got momentum happening in the world at the moment. Your background um, across the electric vehicle space, can you tell us um, a little bit about that? Yeah, certainly. So I started um, my career working in emissions reductions of the passenger transport sector in a, in a California policy office. Um, and, and that brought me to my next career move, which was working in, um, in Tesla. And, and my role there was varied, but it was around policy and promoting the, the industry development opportunities that electric vehicles provided. Um, at the time, Tesla was the only company um, globally producing current electric vehicles for sale, not for compliance. Um, so over my, my professional history, while my background has been in policy and business development, it's really focused around um, emerging technology adoption and helping consumers and industry bodies and even governments create pathways for this emerging technology to be commercially viable and accessible by, by, the, by the marketplace. And uh, in terms of your experience with Tesla, what are we talking, which years are we talking about? Because this is sort of well before electric vehicles were really on the radar yeah. for, for most consumers, right? But Tesla was really yeah. at the forefront of this. That's right. So I was employee 109 at Tesla from 2006. Wow. I worked until the end of 2008. Um, and I actually, uh, I tell everyone this because it's true. My first role there was um, executive assistant to the CEO. So at the time, Tesla had no policy team and it was just developing a marketing and sales team. Um, and so there were very few non-engineering roles, but I knew it was such an exciting place to be. And I also valued the access that that level of role provided me to the things that happened at a decision maker level around growing the company. And that was something that was really interesting to me um, as, a, as a new entrant to Silicon Valley. So I jumped at the opportunity and as with all startups, very quickly moved into other activities and roles. So um, it was a really interesting time, but um, as many people know who have worked at Tesla or heard about the culture there, it's, it's a full on experience. And at that time in my life, I was, uh, I was really eager to uh, fulfill my, my graduate degree dream. So I left Tesla to pursue a master's and that's what brought me to Australia. Fantastic. Well, while we're on the um, topic of, of study, uh, following your master's, you've obviously done the doctorate now, and um, you've been looking around, you've been looking at issues around the uptake of electric vehicles in Australia and uh, consumer attitudes here versus abroad. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Look, there are in Australia a number of recurrent barriers that get discussed. The first is upfront cost of EVs and how much more expensive they are relative to petrol cars. And that has partly to do with the way the economics shift when you have the fuel on board, meaning the battery storage, relative to just having an empty you know, metal tank that you fill up with, with liquid fuel uh, on a regular basis. Uh, number two has to do with the industry just being new and having those economies of scale push through with higher volumes of product, which EVs haven't yet seen globally, but will soon. 
from the second commonly cited barriers around charging infrastructure. And obviously there's a third one relating to range and how those two go together. So people don't think there's enough chargers and they feel like the battery in their cart isn't going to get them to where they need to go. So they hesitate to buy and, and hold off until the products are more developed. But in, in my personal experience as an electric vehicle advocate, I went to buy an EV in, in 2013. And when I walked into the car dealership, I was directed to a petrol car and then told I had to come back on a different day because the EV salesperson wasn't available and no one else was qualified to, to sell me the car. It got me thinking that if someone with my experience and understanding couldn't easily transact, what was it like for other shoppers? And so um, I undertook that as the topic for my, my PhD thesis, studying the, um, the commercial aspects of sales an electric car and all of the educational barriers and informational barriers that come along with normalizing the technology for everyday people. And that's really the, the process that's necessary to mainstream electric cars in the same way that we all now use smartphones and have other devices that you wouldn't think you need, but have become a, a really important functional part of our everyday lives. So that, um, that journey, that personal journey and story has led me to, to focus my current work around the consumers of electric vehicles and the end users and how we work together with industry and government to create a 360 degree feedback loop around that experience to improve the process, to shorten the sales cycle, and to accelerate the adoption to this new technology and the related technologies like right. solar, battery storage, green energy accounts with your electricity retailer, home charging, etc. Well, there's a lot to unpack there in what you just uh, described, but um, I suppose what Tesla has done is they've taken the direct sales model uh, and removed the whole franchise dealership from the sales equation. And I think that has played a huge part in, in sales overseas, particularly in America, where you have such, uh, such I suppose, political um, input from franchise dealers in, in state legislatures. Do you think in Australia, um, the direct sales model is going to make a big impact to the take up of electric vehicles here? Look, it's, it's a new pathway to market that I think matches well with the way people shop nowadays. And it's not necessarily specific to electric vehicles, but mm. it's more specific with the way that people buy things and research what they're going to buy next. Um, more than 70% of purchase decisions are made from your mobile phone in the comfort of your home around business hours now. And so what I think we're drawing from that is that the, the mechanisms that were previously used to sell things, specifically really large um, family assets like cars are shifting. And we're seeing that now through the way the automotive industry is looking to sell its cars, doing so online, but also doing so in shopping centers. And I've just recently seen in supermarkets. So mm. really trying to attract that um, time poor, you know, low, a low investment of, of uh, available weekend time to, to commit to researching things in person and shifting that part of the sales journey digitally mm. um, and, and, and in a convenient manner. I've spent a bit of time in the, um, in the sales industry working for manufacturers in Australia. And it's, it's sort of, um, there's this juxtaposition between selling a technologically advanced product, but having a sales system and process for consumers that is quite antiquated. Um, so I know that um, I know that there is some frustration um, around consumer confidence um, in actually purchasing a new vehicle or knowing how to purchase a new vehicle. Um, so that that obviously plays a big role too uh, in any purchase. So it's not just the fear of uh, sort of unknown technology or range with battery electric vehicles. It's the the ease of the sales process. So I think I think Honda and Mercedes Benz are actually uh, moving to a an online um, uh, a sort of non franchised sales system in Australia too. I'm I'm not sure about those specific brands, but what I can speak to is it is a, it is a tricky one, isn't it? Because yeah. on the one hand, you, you need to have the digital experience, but when it comes to buying something as expensive and important in terms of how uh, the role it plays in your life and also how long you keep it for it as in a mm. car, there's a need to touch and feel. Um, and by that, I mean, you've got to get inside yes. it and take it for a drive to really seal the deal for most purchases <laughs> or even leases. So, mm. um, you know, to your point, there is there is new ways of doing that that are emerging. And, and, and that's why I founded World, because I knew that there was a need for more opportunity for access to electric vehicles, but also an alternative channel to the traditional sales model to help normalize the technology and inform customers about the attributes of owning and operating an EV. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about World and what you're trying to achieve through this new uh, uh, company. 
Yeah, thank you. So whirl is for give it a whirl, which is the concept around come and try something out and decide if you like it before you invest a lot of time in committing to the purchase. And the thing with a new car is it is, you know, usually a 50 50- thousand dollar or more purchase if you're buying it brand new and something just below that if you choose an alternative model. Um, so World was founded um, to accelerate the transition to a clean energy economy by providing customers with the tools that they need to empower themselves through the sales process. And the way that we do that is by providing targeted information to our customers through that 360 degree feedback loop I mentioned, as well as offering opportunities to speak to existing owners of electric vehicles. Now, this is something that's readily available for you to do informally at public events or people you meet on the street or neighbors, um, which has long been the way that we have learned about this technology um, so far. But as the market grows and interest in electric vehicles expands, World will provide that service digitally. So you can go online, chat to someone who you've never met that maybe lives in WA but has the exact car that you want and hear everything there is to know about it. Or perhaps you just found that someone who has um, an electric vehicle and a charger at home lives a couple blocks away from you. So you can book in a time to meet up with them and have them show you what it's all about before you have to go into a showroom and, uh, and commit your time. Well, I think you've tapped into something really special here because a lot of um, early adopters with electric vehicles are very happy um, to actually showcase their purchases and advocate for the new technology, aren't they? Um, So as as someone who has an EV, can I literally just sign up to your website and then say I would like to become an advocate and uh, be available for people who are inquiring? Yeah, that's right. Just a couple of weeks ago, we have launched the World EVM ambassador program and we're currently taking registrations we've had more than 50 national um, uh, ev owners sign up with interest so the program um, qualifies electric vehicle owners and their and their setup um, as part of the program and then in the next couple of weeks launching before may hopefully the program will be available online at giveitaworld.co for you to come and sign up book in to do a telephone chat a video conference or an in-person demo with one of our ambassadors um, to learn about their product and their experience buying an EV, which can include things like, you know, what's your relationship been with a particular dealer or you bought your car secondhand, what did you look out for? Um, What insurer do you use or what have you found um, in relation to the service schedule? You know, the sorts of things that are pretty easily understood and you can read about online, Mm -hmm. but sometimes you just want to spend 30 minutes talking to someone who's done it before that you trust. Right. That has no vested interest in, in selling you anything in particular. That's just volunteering their time for a small fee to, um, to explain to you what it's all about. And these people, as you said, are really passionate and uh, want the same things that we want at World, which is to accelerate the transition to a new technology and a clean energy economy. It's interesting, so please do it? come and visit. Yeah, I'll definitely drop the uh, link down below for people to, uh, to check it out. Um, it's interesting because for our, our largest purchase, which is a house, um, there's a lot of information online to be able to sort of um, rate agents and vet properties and that sort of thing. But apart from um, sort of a very casual framework of forums and things, I suppose, around the vehicle purchasing experience, there isn't really somewhere that people can go to know that they're getting sort of impartial advice in the purchasing process. So this sounds really uh, fantastic for Australians. I'm hopeful that it will be really useful. And as I mentioned, those world ambassadors will be speaking to customers and providing feedback into us around what questions are being asked, what information do we need more analysis on, and then world will continue to provide that information via its websites and social channels at Shop with World. So visit Shop with World for tips on how to buy an EV and the related technologies and, um, and come talk to us when you're ready to learn a little bit more about electric vehicles and their related products. That's great. Do you see world uh, going well? worldwide um, after a successful launch in Australia or? Look, that's my hope. It's absolutely a scalable model because there are people all across the world who maybe aren't interested in um, packaged products or um, uh, want to make the shift to a clean energy lifestyle, but are time poor, perhaps they're working parents or they just aren't engineers and don't understand the materials available online. But making that shift with the support of peers um, and through a model that has an interest in in, in empowering them to make a decision that suits them um, is certainly something I can see happening in any country in the world. Mm. We've spoken a little bit about uh, consumer confidence in regards to technology and the sales process, but what are some of the other factors do you think, I suppose, around legislation and government that are hindering our adoption of EVs in Australia? 
Well, there's been a lot of discussion in the news lately around taxes and mm. where taxes should and shouldn't be placed on certain products or technologies. So, for example, the Victorian, New South Wales and South Australian governments have considered the option of a specific tax on electric vehicles, um, given their um, lack of contribution to fuel excise. But what I know from my experience as a researcher in new technology adoption is that anything that is seen to be a tax or an, uh, a, an extra measure against utilizing something you discourages people from taking it up not only because it's an extra cost but it's an extra complication around wrapping your head around a new lifestyle it's very disappointing to see the australian government uh, as a whole as well as some of the states view electric vehicles um, as commonplace, when in reality, there's a lot of educational barrier that still exists amongst the Australian public and understanding uh, the benefits and opportunities of adopting them. So, so certainly that's the biggest issue at the moment. Um, there are a couple of other measures, for example, the, the luxury car tax is uh, as allocated to electric vehicles at a certain price point as with other cars, um, given the economic and environmental benefits attributed to electric vehicles um, when they're operational, there's certainly a benefit that might remove the need for that luxury tax. So there are quite a few things that could be revisited in terms of providing more accommodation for EVs without necessarily providing a direct incentive. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And we won't get too far into the, the whole tax discussion, but there's been a lot of talk around that, that EVs, EV drivers don't pay their fair share, so to speak. And I think that's that really is a bit of rubbish because you know, when you're purchasing a car that's worth fifty, seventy, a hundred thousand dollars, you're paying import duty, you're paying 10% goods and services tax, you're paying your state stamp duties. Um, so EV drivers are certainly paying on their purchases. Um, and with any new technology whether it has been in the past electricity at the turn of the century or even telephones and things in the US, this, this technology has been subsidised by the government. So also the, the notion that it should be up to the market to roll out this technology is not something that really, really works. And we've seen with Norway, with the United States and with the UK, for example, that they have accelerated uptake through, uh, through subsidies and grants, haven't they? That's right. And I think what we've seen overseas is really, and what we're not seeing in Australia is really a vision. It's a long-term vision for the future that says, we recognize that what's happening right now is the transition and this period, uh, you know, the incentives and the policies that are in place to encourage the, the mental shift to something new are transitional. And in order for us to get to this long run vision of what could be better, uh, more efficient, uh, better economically, and, and most importantly, better sustainably, um, will take time and will take effort. So if we had that kind of long-term vision, I think we might see a different policy activity um, on a year-to-year -year level in Australia. But unfortunately, that long-term vision hasn't yet been enacted as it has been in the yes. United States, Norway, and so forth. Mm. Um, I'm hopeful that um, in due course, we'll be able to sort of see the end game but uh, it remains to be seen. I mean, the, the environment and the discourse has certainly changed uh, for the positive in Australia, I believe, in the last couple of years. There's certainly a lot of new models coming out this year. Um, there's some great uh, EV startups in Australia and charging networks rolling out, but uh, investment infrastructure, uh, battery technology and, and, and manufacturers, they need policy certainty, don't they, to actually drive the market and drive consumer demand. That's absolutely right. And it's it's amazing that the industry has gone as far as it has because mm. there has been, um, apart from some support from ARENA and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, um, industry has really been going on its own in terms of building the electric vehicle market. And what we're seeing as a result of that and as a result of the global movement is, uh, is there is interest. Uh, consumers, you know, more than 50% of uh, Australians say they're interested in an electric vehicle for their next car. But what's really important and one of the founding values of Whirl is that customer only makes a purchase decision once every 10 years. So if we don't get them in a, into an electric vehicle in their next purchase, then we have to wait another eight to 10 years before they're ready to buy one again. And that's incredibly detrimental insofar as we think about sustainable development goals and shifting the emissions trajectory for the passenger transport sector down to where it needs to be. So, so really the, the impetus for me is around accelerating that shift as quickly as possible because we know we have a one in a 10 opportunity to convert a customer. That's key. I, I really agree with you on that point, because I think in this discussion about electric vehicles and, you know, cost to the economy and cost to taxpayers, 
health concerns and tailpipe emissions are very rarely discussed, at least uh, in the media um, and from a government point of view. And Australia has some of the, the worst emissions and some of the worst health outcomes from, from tailpipe emissions, I think, in the OECD. Um, you know, and we also need fuel quality standards and emission standards. So uh, environmental concerns certainly need to be brought to the fore on this. You're right. There's a long wish list. And one thing I'll add that came from my Tesla days is it really can be a no compromise situation. Mm. Like, for example, you can have a beautiful, fast, highly efficient and environmentally friendly car that enables you to get from A to B with very little difficulty. And you don't have to sort of take a hit on, you know, one aspect of your wish list. Um, so I think that's something that's often misunderstood about electric vehicles um, is, is you don't have to compromise something around your normal daily driving paradigm but what you do need to do is adjust to a slightly different lifestyle but the outcome of that is that you do have those economic health and environmental benefits um, that you were maybe looking for or looking to contribute to in some way but didn't know what the right way was. And that's the thing I think particularly uh, as, as the world's population grows and as our cities become denser um, you know the notion of improving the sort of marginal social benefits from our activities of, of driving and operating a vehicle are, are crucial. You know, we actually have to consider our effects on other people, don't we? Absolutely. I think it's something that's in light of what's happened in 2020 with COVID that's become much more apparent to the everyday person. You know, do I have my mask with me? Have I sanitized my hands? Am I staying 1.5 meters away? Those kinds of immediate impacts that we can make through our own behavior can be applied to other aspects of our lives. So whether it be recycling or reducing your waste or choosing to walk or cycle or use public transport rather than, than driving your own car, um, there are many, many decisions that customers make or I'm sorry, that consumers make every time they leave their home or buy something um, that, that really do make a difference. So I'm hoping some of those learnings from the COVID times um, will be applied at the environmental sustainability behaviors mm. of everyday users. And, and that's really what World's about is helping people who want to make that lifestyle shift uh, have easier access to um, support to doing so because it's really it's a big it's a big shift and it's one um that you, you really can't go alone so if you don't know who to talk to if you don't know where to go for help you're probably going to defer that shift until you feel comfortable or uh, able to accommodate it so to the extent that we can help you make that shift sooner we're available and ready and on that point of world helping consumers make the shift to electrification i think it's really uh, important because as a large country of people who like to drive a lot, I think our perceptions about what we need from a vehicle uh, are sort of stuck uh, in the last few decades. And with electrification, we really need to um, reassess how we drive, how we commute, um, and what is required from a vehicle, don't we? Absolutely. And that's part of the lifestyle shift that I think people struggle yes. with is really transitioning, you know, in the same way you, you transitioned away from your household phone to Wi-Fi at home and, and your mobile device, you know, that shift took time and it took um, a normalization that happens within a society that if you're not seeing and hearing um, isn't real for you. And, and so that kind of behavior, that digitization, the, um, the sustainable shift that we're, we're all seeing in, in micro changes will become much more macro um, over time. And I, look, it's not something that everyone pays attention to, you know, that the, the incredible number of um, battery solutions that have been introduced into uh, front of the meter grid solutions is not apparent to your everyday uh, Australian. And that's, that's okay, because it's it's not necessarily of interest to everyone, but, but what is, is is how you drive, what it costs you, and what that experience is like. Um, so for me now, we didn't mention it earlier, but I'm, I'm sitting in my car. Um, I'm sitting in my car because we're talking about cars, and but also it's quiet, and it's climate controlled, and it's very low impact, and it means that I can have this conversation with you in private, um, away from any kind of noises of an office or, or, or public workspace or home, and, uh, and I'm very really comfortable. I'm comfortable in my climate control controlled uh, solar powered car. So it's, uh, it's, you know, who knows? it could be a mobile office. <laughs> it, to it totally could. And I mean, we're seeing manufacturers like Hyundai um, coming up with uh, vehicle to load options where you can plug in a laptop computer or a, a 60 inch uh, LED TV if you wanted to. So uh, uh, right. battery, battery electric vehicles will be changing the way that we, we work and actually do more than commute, right? Absolutely. I think now maybe we might set a trend with uh, Zooms in your car, but yeah. it has to be electric. Otherwise, there will 
and tailpipe exhaust, and that's not okay. Idle off. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Now, you've um, obviously owned a number of EVs and you've recently, recently taken delivery of uh, this new Hyundai Ioniq. Can you tell us maybe about uh, one of your favourite or most memorable drives in an electric vehicle? Oh, wow. That's an interesting one. Look, I have to say um, my most memorable current drive is, is actually with this Ioniq. We've, we've had it now for a month. It's the third EV we've had. We had um, a Mitsubishi Army, which was the first EV you could get mm. in Australia. Um, commercially, so that was why we had that one. Um, we, we've also had a, a Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid, which suited us really well for the longer trips uh, before those battery ranges got up to where they need to be. Having worked at Tesla, we've driven so many Teslas uh, that we, we haven't yet bought one, but we will soon. Um, but what's been great about this car is going from the 120 kilometer range of the IMEV into the 300 plus range of the Ionic. It seems like 300, oh, maybe that's not enough. That's sort of half of what my ICE car can get. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. But as, um, as the principal driver in our household who does all of the shopping and uh, dropping off to grandmas and daycare and visiting friends and, and all that sort of stuff, I was really surprised that my very first uh, need to charge my car was one week after I first charged it. And at that point, the car was only at 25%. And I had done more than eight hours of driving. And wow. I think for people who are really worried about range, um, you know, you don't really think about what your normal driving is and how far you go because you don't need to. But when you start to pay attention to it, you'll realize that having 300 kilometers range for most people who do inner city driving like mine, it's actually not a problem at all. And um, and so when I do need to charge, I can charge at home, plug it in at night, the car's ready in the morning, or I can go to one of the many now emerging, as you mentioned earlier, fast charge stations, plug in. And in the time that I've, you know, caught up on my emails and social media, media or taking my my daughter for a swing on that nearby playground uh, maybe gotten a coffee wherever I'm located the car is ready to go it, it happens so much more quickly than you think you know those 20 to 45 minutes that it takes to go from nearly empty to nearly full happens fast so it's it's less of a detriment than you realize once you actually have that experience and this is the thing I know not everyone has access to a powerpoint at their place of residence but the notion that you can actually come out to your vehicle and it is at 90% or 100% charged every single day um, is a huge step change in personal transportation, isn't it? No longer are we going to service stations to, to fill up. And people, that will be a huge selling point for a lot of people, I think. It's, it's great. And, and the other thing that's often misunderstood is that people think that you're always going to empty the car completely, which is never the case. So mm. all of the statistics you see online around charging times and range, they're not really necessarily relevant because you might have driven 30 kilometers today. You plug in overnight, your car's full in an hour, maybe less, and you're ready to go full again the next day. So those sort of extremes are communicated to help people wrap their head around the worst case scenario. But in actuality, it's not your normal day-to-day -day driving. Now, I'll just say quickly, if you're doing a road trip, let's say you're going, I did a road trip on the weekend. My family went up to uh, Lamington National Park, which is about 100 kilometers from inner city Brisbane. Um, we were able to do the, the round trip journey without any charging. And even though we were going to a remote location where there was no public charging um, and all of the residences and businesses were off grid, we, we didn't sweat it because we did a quick look at the map. Yep, we're fine. Even if there was an emergency scenario, we had the travel cable in the back, which can plug into a 10 amp outlet. No problems. And Queensland has actually rolled out a uh, DC fast charging network spanning quite a, quite a lot of the state, hasn't it? Yeah, that's right. So the Queensland Electric Superhighway, I think now has 22 stations wow. and they're quite well dispersed in and amongst the, the private networks, you know, so Chargefox, EV networks and a couple mm. of other providers, like, for example, the Queensland University of Technology has a charger just out the front, which I used the other day. Um, there, there are a lot of options available. And in terms of um, fast charging versus home charging, do you think we need some sort of um, direction from government in terms of mandating um, uh, readiness for charging infrastructure for, say, new dwellings and new commercial buildings? Look, I think it's uh, not having provisions for charging infrastructure for people who don't live in um, their own home is is it definitely an, an inhibitor to adoption. Now, it's not necessarily as much of an inhibitor as it was before because of the, the public charging networks that have have. Um, been made available. But I think in terms of having that sustainable lifestyle, where if you live in an apartment complex and you want to have renewably powered energy and you want to have an electric 
electric vehicle, you should be able to do so. And we know that there are mechanisms in place and, and also technologies in place that enable that kind of accommodation in buildings. So it, it absolutely should be the case that government recommends changes to the relevant codes and regulations to enable that option for dwellings um, and, and the residents of those dwellings. And there's a lot of talk around um, the effect of mass EV uptake on the electricity grid. What, what are your thoughts around, around that in terms of um, uh, electricity regulation and charging at different times of the day and that sort of thing? Look, I think there's a lot that is not well understood about how people charge, when they charge, how much they charge, and that the unknown around that creates fear, fear of uncontrolled um, activity or unfamiliar activity for grid regulators and and not being able to manage the grid economically efficiently uh, is a risk. So, So there certainly needs to be further study of the behavior around electric vehicle charging and, um, and to some levels, support for smart charging mechanisms that can be introduced to control charging times. But I think over-regulation of charging behavior can be can be potentially a deterrent, much like the, the tax that we talked before. Um, instead, I think viewing electric vehicles as an opportunity to optimize grid performance over time, particularly as bi-directional features become available, meaning you can power your house from your car, for example, at a peak time, rather than pay for expensive electricity should be considered. So I'd really love to see the the course of the discussion become more positive and opportunistic rather than um, based in fear. Yeah, that's great. Uh, just finally, I uh, would like to talk briefly about hydrogen. Um, what, what, are your t- what are your thoughts on hydrogen uh, vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell versus battery electric vehicles? Look, my, um, my, opinion is that electric vehicles are clearly the winner in terms of economic efficiency and environmental impact. And the key hesitation I have around hydrogen has to do with the infrastructure provision and and the lack thereof, as well as we currently don't have any products in the marketplace. However, given the sustainability potential um, presented by hydrogen, I think it's important that we continue to invest in a diversity of fuels and options, um, but but do so in a way that makes sense in terms of staging and resource allocation. Hydrogen's become kind of the poster child for sustainable fuels Mm. um, more recently. And while it has some merit, I think um, currently industry is demonstrating to us that um, electric power, battery powered vehicles are their preference in terms of the amount of time and planning and uh, resource investment that goes into scaling that kind of technology. So um, governments shouldn't be picking a winner, but we certainly should be following the advice of industry and supporting an efficient rollout of a new technology um, as quickly Mm. as possible. Yeah, it's clear that government and industry is pushing towards a hydrogen future for Australia. Um, but uh, in, t- in terms of uh, vehicles, uh, it's unless unless we're looking unless we're talking about green hydrogen, um, really there's there's no point because as you say, the loss of uh, efficiencies in electrolyzing that hydrogen, transporting it, storing it, refueling, it's just not uh, changing the way that we we move around, is it? No, and there is there's still a bit to work out there. I mean, it's it sounds great conceptually, mm. but mechanically there's there's a, there's a little bit to work through. So I think characterizing it in terms of a when this solution is likely to be commercially viable um, is is another important aspect of this question. Really, you know, are we looking sort of at a ten year trajectory or more like a twenty year trajectory? So it has a place. It's just a matter of when and how. I know that uh, Transit Systems that operates buses in Sydney and around the country uh, are looking at uh, trialling hydrogen here. Um, Do you think that uh, it has potentially better applications in uh, commercial fleets rather than in private fleets? I think potentially, and and I think really really what it relates to is, is how... Um, those vehicles travel, you know, meaning the regularity of their refueling and what kind of um, support can be created for introducing new refueling stations. So it's, it's, it's actually a question, I think, around the sensitivities of the grid versus the sensitivities of installing new infrastructure. This, this is one aspect of the energy market that I think really does need to be explored and understood better. You know, there are aspects in our electricity network where there is weakness and placing things like high powered DC charging is is a is a risk. So if that is concurrent with a bus route, um, maybe electric 
isn't the best option for that particular mm -hmm. bus route. Maybe hydrogen is a better option or, or, or gas, you know, so, so a careful planning around infrastructure, around transit behavior, around cost uh, must occur for each individual application. We're seeing a lot of Australian states really going it alone in terms of uh, energy policy from the federal government, uh, particularly with uh, large amounts of battery storage coming online in the next few years. Do you think that will really uh, help manage um, and mitigate any issues around uh, mass EV adoption? Um, I think that we've already seen some really great success stories coming out of, for example, the South Australian, uh, you know, the most publicized the Hornsdale, battery, yeah. within, the Hornsdale battery. That's right. Sorry. Um, so, so we know that it does a really good job at providing instant solution when there's a, a pressure in the grid. Mm. Um, in terms of managing electric vehicle load, I think it's probably more likely that other solutions will be introduced behind the meter, such as smart charging to help manage the grid at the localized level rather mm. than um, at, at, at a grid level. Um, and that's necessary because it's going to be really difficult, as I said earlier, to plan for when people will be charging. Um, so especially, especially now that our um, societal shift around COVID has meant that not everyone's going to the office as often as they were. So that sort of risk, everything that we understood about the way people travel and behave and are likely to charge pre-COVID mm. is now different post-COVID because the, the movements of the workforce have changed. So I would say that lends itself to further modeling. Um, but but I, would, I would argue that a better solution is to encourage smart charging at home rather than to depend on costly um, battery infrastructure to accommodate the unknown. Totally, totally. And since you bring up smart charging, just finally, um, we've seen this week that um, a number of state, uh, in, a number of state energy ministers are looking to actually adopt new protocols to allow, I think, uh, network operators to actually switch off rooftop solar and uh, EV charges um, to to reduce load on the system and things like that. Do you think that's a good idea? This is a controversial question. I, I think. It's it's not so simple. I think it's important yeah. that the um, energy market operators have the ability to deliver efficiently priced green electricity. That's a priority. I also think it's a priority for the consumer to have choice in relation to how they interact with that energy market. And that's something we're not seeing enough of yet. So my lens is the consumer and end user lens. My view is that the 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 tone of the discussion around how the market operates tends to be around regulation and removing consumer choice in order to provide economic efficiency. But as the business models emerge and the new technologies mm. become more prevalent around consumer interactivity with the grid, we will probably see a shift in that regulatory tone because there will need, there will need to be more options for consumers to be able to participate in what is ultimately a financial market. Um, so at present, I think... Yeah, I, my long-term view is that I, I don't agree with that approach. Mm. It's just, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we've traditionally seen um, government and big energy operators not worry so much about what's happening behind the meter, but as we transition to renewables, um, basically they're now moving to behind the meter and, and they're seeing that their services can actually be a part of what happens in the home and in the driveway. Yeah, absolutely. There's a huge convergence between what has happened in the energy sector and, and what people do at home. And whether that's driving or turning on their appliances or speaking to their phone. And uh, as that convergence continues into an integration, we'll see the consumer become frustrated that they don't have control over that integration and, and that won't stand. So um, I'm looking forward to that point in time when I can become a, uh, an energy market operator in my home, but I think it's still a few years out it, to be fair. <laughs> Well, Alina, thank you so much for joining us on uh, EV Brief today. Uh, for anyone who's listening or watching, please check out uh, giveitaworld.co. That's the right address, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Thanks very much. Or uh, uh, Shop With World on uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. At Shop With World. Okay, fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that concludes this episode in conversation with Dr. Alina Dini. We could easily have taken up Alina's whole afternoon with questions, such as the breadth of her experience, but we'll have to ask her back on the show another time. If you're an EV owner, make sure to check out her new EV shopping site, Whirl, at giveitaworld.co. It's launching in the next few months. If you're not a subscriber to this show, please subscribe on your favourite podcast platform and head over to evbrief.com to stay up to date with the latest EV news and reviews. 
Thanks so much for listening to the podcast today. I'm Jonathan McFeet, and you've been listening to EV Brief.